in a world of nausea and fear and tension, the trip to the beaches begins. At the spear tip of this historic seaborne attack are some 3,000 men. My abiding memory is seeing all these young men floating in the water. The water was red with blood and some of them struggling with these enormous packs on the back and there was nothing we could do to help them. And that was my father, that was the... You know, my great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. Who's that? Uh, and that's uh, my maternal grandmother. I'm Arthur Raymond Wilson. I'm 88. I was 19 when I joined up. I said, well, I would like to be trained in something in the engineering side. Oh, no, we don't need engineers at the moment. But we do need communication ratings. So you will become a telegraphist. You didn't have a choice, you see. You don't really think of the danger at the time. You're really there to say, well, my pals are in it. I want to be in it too. I was going to be one of the beach landing party where we would have landed before any invasion and then uh, marshal people coming ashore. Did these all survive, did they? We were all friends at that time. Oh, look at me, there's nothing on me. I'm like you in those days, you <laughs> see. On the channel where the sea strikes France stood the west wall of concrete, stone and steel. Preparations were being made for the D-Day landings. The whole of southern England was one huge armed camp. All the roads leading to the ports were stacked up with lorries, tanks, with equipment stretching miles along the sides of the road. We actually sailed with a convoy from Southampton to meet up with this 4,500 ships which took part in the invasion. You could have practically walked to France across all the ships, there were that many. Unless you saw it, you just cannot appreciate the scale of the operation. It was absolutely enormous. We were escorting the first wave of the British Second Army in on Gold Beach, which was the 50th Division. Quite a number of these came to grief on the underwater obstacles, and my abiding memory is seeing all these young men floating in the water. The water was red with blood. Some of them struggling with these enormous packs on the back, and there was nothing we could do to help them because the whole idea was to get people ashore. It was, hurry, hurry, come on, get ashore, get ashore. And the idea was that they would get this 125,000 men, British and Americans, ashore on the first day. And there was no time to help these poor fellows who were actually drowning. Fortunately, we could turn back and come away and although we were in the thick of the shell fire that was coming from the Germans, we escaped completely unscathed and it was only afterwards that you suddenly realise, you think, by God, we were lucky, we never got a scratch. In wartime, you rely on your mates, you see. The bloke next to you is the one you've got to rely on, you know, to look after you when you look after him and uh, that's what it's all about. They've all died. Were these all very good friends of yours? Yes, there was Roy Wheeler who ran the uh, village shop. I really want to go back to Normandy to pay tribute to those brave young men who never made it on the first day. They were all young conscripts like me. They'd all be 18 to 20 year olds in the prime of their life, but uh, they didn't have a choice. They were just told to go and they went. If I was able and young, I'd definitely go again if the need was there, but I'd hope the need was never there. <laughs>